Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to First Congregational Church. We're so glad you're here, so glad you could worship with us. We always begin by saying that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And the reason for that is that love comes first here. In all our decisions, in all that we do, love comes first. Um, today we have a very special day. We have a very special uh, preacher who will be preaching today, Reverend Marilyn Kendricks, who was the, um, I'm trying to, <laughs> wow, that is great. It's, you know, it's rare that people get ovations here. Um, um, but what I, I wanted to say was that she was the, and I can't think of the word now, but the interim um, conference minister in the formation of our new conference uh, before she retired. Um, this, is, um, this is a conclusion, or you might say, the, the just the, the um, crescendo of what we've been doing this month and Black History Month, and we're so glad that she could come and share with us. Um, a couple of quick announcements. Um, I don't know if you've been reading about um, our volunteer work at Nurse Bridgeport, but what we've been told from there is that they really need people to be working on Tuesdays instead of, uh, uh, has it been Mondays? The over here. Thursday. Thursday. They need your help on Thursdays. Sorry, Rich. Help on Thursdays uh, because that's um, a major time when they are needing more volunteers. I was also supposed to announce that the pasta dinner next Saturday um, here at the church, um, I've heard that the person who uh, uh, that does this grew up in a good Italian family and makes great gravy. It's sauce, not gravy. All right. All right, it's sauce. So I hope you can join us uh, this next Saturday for a great pasta dinner. Let's now prepare our hearts for worship.
Thank you, Dr. Jones. <clears throat> Would you please join me in the call to worship? People of God, on this wilderness journey, what will you eat? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. People of God, in this time of temptation, how will you live? Our faith is in the People of God, at this kingdom crossroad, whom will you serve? We will worship the Lord our God alone. Our first hymn will be Lord, who throughout these 40 days, and it can be found in your chalice hymnal number 180. Would you please rise and body your spirit? <laughs>
the Bible <coughs> the Bible reading today will be from the book of Genesis. It can be found in your pew Bible on page two. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may feel free to eat every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor sh shall you touch it or sh you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made long cloths for themselves. Would you please join me in the prayer of confession? Holy One, you know the ways of good and evil. You know the things that tempt us and the things that give us life. You know our nakedness and you know our sin. We confess that we have disobeyed your call, denying your providence and care, relying on your own cleverness. Have mercy on us, we pray. Cover us with your grace. Feed us with the bread of life and create us in your image through Jesus Christ. Hear the good news. Happy are those whose sin is forgiven. Be glad in the Lord and shout for joy. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us praise God. Sovereign God, lover of justice, and lover of all those that you have created, we come before you humbly this morning, knowing how our nation has fallen short of its creed, that all men and women are created equal, 
and that we have been complicit in it. We come looking at the deep wounds in our nation and not knowing where to even begin to start to heal them. Forgive us not only for turning our heads from things we don't want to admit, but for, but for our despair and giving up, our lack of belief that change can happen, that you can make all things new. The prophets have called us to love justice and to walk humbly with our God. During this Lenten journey, humble us, O oh God. Rid, of, rid us of any arrogance. Help us to fall on our knees and on our faces and to seek your mercy, not only for ourselves, but for our nation and for our world. We pray for all who are hungry, hungry for a simple meal. Help us all to realize that we don't live by bread alone, but help us to get bread to those who have none, especially from the abundance of our lives and of your creation. We pray for our church and all churches in this time of trial whether tested by change or by the pandemic or tempted by safety of the status quo. Help us first and foremost to be faithful. Help us to pray as Jesus did the night before his death and say, not my will, but yours be done and give us peace when anger and fear threaten to divide us and challenge us all when we are too comfortable with the world. We pray for our leaders in high places, whether those determined to help those who suffer or distant from the cries of the oppressed. Open our eyes to see your saving power at work and open our ears to hear the prophet's call for justice. Holy One, instruct us in the way that we should go. And let your steadfast love surround us always. And, oh God, we pray that you would anoint our pastor with power and might to preach the good news boldly. Just as Jesus did. As we pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as God so freely offers us the gift of life in Jesus Christ, let us respond with gratitude, offering our lives to God. Would the ushers please come forward now to receive the tithes and the offerings?
Captain. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the free and abundant gift of grace in Jesus Christ. Let the simple gift of our lives be a sign of our unending gratitude for your undying love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Would all who are able now rise in either body or spirit as we sing hymn number 655, Community of Christ. folks online. We are so blessed to have Reverend Marilyn Bow Kendricks with us this morning. Her bio is in the bulletin and the pastor's letter, so I'll let you read about her impressive background, which includes degrees, a successful career in corporate America, and then her pivot 
intentional pivot to ministry when she went to Yale. What you won't read in her Bible is that I was working with a friend, his name was Tony. He was my IT guy. And I will tell you, I was very dependent upon Tony. And Tony would come in where I worked and he would sit at my computer or crawl under my desk and fix whatever it was that was wrong, just like magic. But I found out that Tony was committed to fixing much more than what was wrong with my computer. As a formerly incarcerated young man, he had a mission, and people like Reverend Kendricks and others were working with him to make meaningful and effective criminal justice reform in Connecticut. Her personal ministry has included preaching at over 100 churches to raise awareness about mass incarceration in America. She co-wrote The Justice Imperative, How Hyper-Incarceration Has Hijacked the American Dream, which is on our social justice table. Reverend Kendrick's current social justice preaching ministry addresses systemic racism and the controversy over critical race theory. She's currently writing another book, Who the Real Christians Are, a social justice memoir. May we listen with our ears, minds, and hearts to her sermon temptations, and may our hearts ponder. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? Thank you, Reverend Kendricks, for sharing this Christian message with us today. Good morning, church. Good morning. It is so good to be here with you this morning to bring you this message. Um, I have been preaching social justice ministry since 2012, and you are church number 157 on my list. I only have 602 in the conference to get to, so I still have a long way to go. It's my way to keep from dying, right? I just, I'm not finished, Lord. <laughs> I bring you greetings from the Spring Glen Congregational Church in Hamden, Connecticut, where I am a member with my husband and one of my daughters and two of my grandchildren. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, I believe that today's Old Testament reading has been one of the most poorly interpreted in the Bible. It seems to me that growing up in the church, the emphasis has been on the woman inviting the man into sin, or on Adam and Eve's nakedness after they ate of the forbidden fruit. The last time I preached on this lectionary reading, I had a member of my congregation say to me as he was leaving that he couldn't believe that I believed in talking snakes. <laughs> Obviously, my sermon missed its mark that day. So let me be clear and say from the outset that this story is not, did not actually happen. This is a story passed down verbally from generation to generation until it was finally written in sacred scripture, not because early humans believed in talking snakes, but rather because it explores the origins and the consequences of evil. It is a brilliantly crafted allegory that is truly timeless in nature and says something very important about human nature and about our relationship with God. So let's take a moment and examine this story so we begin with a man and a woman, let's call them Adam and Eve. Traditionally, they've been named thus, although in this particular reading, they're just called man and woman of God's creation. So the story begins with them both living in the Garden of Eden. Again, not a real place, but rather a symbolic place that represents a utopia, a perfect place where they have all they need where nothing bad happens, where God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-caring presence. Eden is a garden that they, the humans, must care for. 
and in the great circle of life, the garden sustains them in return. The creation as originally created by a loving God is perfection, perfection itself, and yet things go awry. So let's stop here and examine what we've got. We have early Hebrews attempting to understand their world, constructing a story about their origins. And like all humans, I believe, they have been created by God with a longing for God. I like to call it the God chip that was installed while we were being knit together in our mother's wombs. I believe that most every human born has some kind of deep knowledge inside, knowledge that God is, which explains why every single group of humans that scientists have been able to study have felt the need to establish a religion in hopes of figuring out how to be in relationship with this mysterious something that we all feel. So those ancient Hebrews in telling this story, we're attempting to make sense of both their understanding that they come from a loving God and the fact of the existence of evil in the world. And the fact that evil in the world comes, that's where this snake comes in, right? Now, if you were looking around your environment and your environment was around the area of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, and you wanted to come up with a good symbol for evil, seems to me that a snake would do very nicely. I mean, who isn't skeezed out by snakes, right? So with that in mind, let's go back to the story. So God has given this man and this woman a permit to use anything in the garden anything except the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does that, this tree provide for our story? If the snake is evil, then the tree is what? Temptation. Before their encounter with the sneaky snake, Adam and Eve have no concept of good and evil, right? Humans can only define goodness as it relates to evil. If there is no evil, then there's no concept of good because everything would be good. So Adam and Eve are just living the good life, not realizing that it was good because they had not encountered anything that was not good. But then evil makes an entrance on the scene and evil is very tempting. Evil knows just how to wheedle itself into our brains. Evil knows all the very human buttons to push. And so the snake suggests to these innocent people that God is hiding something from them, that they might be better off if they break the rules and do the one thing that God said they shouldn't do, that they would be gods themselves if they find out what is so special about this particular tree. So the snake tells the woman that she won't die if she eats of the forbidden fruit. And the snake tells her that she and her husband will know everything that God knows if they eat from the forbidden tree. So Eve tasted the fruit. Notice that it does not say anything about an apple. And Adam, who was right there all along, took a piece from her and ate it too. Suddenly, they noticed they're naked. Prior to this, naked just was. But somehow, after eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, their nakedness takes on a value. It becomes something to be concerned about, something to be ashamed of, as if nakedness itself were evil. And I would assume that by the time those ancient Hebrews were telling this story, nakedness had created some evil actions among humans, I bet. Seems likely. So nakedness becomes the symbol of an awareness of the human capacity for evil. And it's this evil intention 
these evil thoughts, these evil actions that create the need to cover them up. And how brilliant is that? Today we hear on the news every day about evil things that people have done to one another, and the very next thing after the evil act is the cover-up, a denial that the evil thing ever happened. We humans do the bad deeds and immediately try to cover it up. And then comes the consequences. In this time in our nation, evil deeds happen every day. Sometimes too many times for us to even process. A war where innocent civilians are murdered by soldiers. Mass shootings of scores of innocent people. Murders of young black men by police, to name a few. So what does this tempting story in Genesis say to us, Christians living in the 21st century? Maybe something about how we humans, when faced with evil, want to run away and hide, just like those humans when they discovered that they were naked. Racism is certainly an evil that our nation has suffered for centuries. And systemic racism continues, even after much progress has been made as a result of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Many in the United States want to hide from the truth of systemic racism. They want, don't want to have that knowledge of the evil of today. And that's where the hysteria over critical race theory begins with a desire to pretend that the evil does not exist and a drive to prevent our children from finding out that the evil of systemic racism continues every day in our nation. Lately, there has been much hysteria over CRT, critical race theory, mostly coming from people who have no idea what critical race theory is. So just so we're all in the same wavelength, let me take a moment and share with you a de definition of critical race theory. This is a quote from Stephen Sawchuk in Education Week magazine. Sawchuk writes, and I quote, critical race theory is an academic concept that is more than 40 years old. The core idea is that race is a social construct and that racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but also something embedded in society's systems and practices and policies." Close quote. By the way, that is not what anyone is teaching in public schools. What is being taught in public schools, hopefully, is a truer, more inclusive history than was taught when you and I were in school. But of course, as we have seen the logical consequences of this hysteria, where folks seek to outlaw the teaching of an inclusive American history, one that includes the history of black people in this country. Just a few short weeks ago, the governor of Florida initiated a move against the state's colleges to assure that they are not teaching CRT because CRT has become this decades racism rallying cry. Like DeSantis, many white people are up in arms about the teaching of African American history as part of the story of our nation. In public schools, K through 12, even at top classes, classes of, of AP classes. And these folks say, well, they say that children Children are made to feel bad, ashamed of their race, or uncomfortable about learning that their founding fathers were human beings, like all of us. They have all the biases and they go along with being human. That they were indeed driven by high-minded theories of democracy and self-government. But they also may have been driven by a desire to hold on to wealth and power. These people who rail against the teaching of 
inclusive American history don't want children to learn these things. They don't want children to feel bad about their race. Now, there's just one thing missing from their assumptions about the children who are taught about racism. Because in all these discussions, when the children that are imagined sitting in those classrooms are feeling bad, when they're mentioned, it's only from the point of view of the white kids, right? It's as if the black kids in the, those classrooms, the children of color, don't exist. They can't see them there. Their point of view does not matter. It's like they're invisible. And remember, no one should be invisible in the beloved community of Christ, a community where neighbors are loving neighbors. Might the black child feel bad about her race if we leave out the reason behind her experiences of racism? that most black children experience by five years old. And that the reason does not point to something wrong with her. Isn't the notion that somehow white children should be protected from ever feeling bad at the expense of black kids being made to feel bad all the time? And internalizing society's view of them, isn't that just another form of white supremacy? Seems like a lack of love for those little black kids, for our black neighbors. And what did Jesus tell us was the greatest commandment and the second to it? That we are to love God and love neighbors. You know, last year I read a post on Facebook where a nine-year-old white girl was asked how she felt about reading the child's version of the 1619 Project that opens up this inclusive American history that many parents are trying to ban from school curriculums. And this was her answer, nine years old. She said, I think the only white people who feel bad or mad or uncomfortable about reading the stuff that white people did in history are people who want to do it again. Close quote. Seeking to learn about the fulsome American history, one that includes stories of, black, of the black experience in America, rather than trying to cover it up as if knowing our true history were somehow evil itself. That is a step that we Christians need to take. Because as Robert A. Brown of Morehouse College put it in an opinion piece on NPR entitled Juneteenth, as a national holiday is symbolism without progress. He said this, quote, there is a growing discontent in the African-American community with symbolic gestures that are presented as progress without any accompanying economic or institutional change, close quote. Hanging a Black Lives Matter sign on your church is a wonderful gesture. And it certainly communicates to people of color in the community that you are a group of Christians who take Jesus' insistence that we love one another seriously. But the work does not end with hanging the sign. Pretending that the evil of systemic racism does not exist is one way that we are enacting the story of Adam and Eve and their desire to cover up the truth of evil in their world. So learning about the structural ways that systemic racism works in our world is the next step. And learning about it is just what Governor DeSantis does not want us to do. So let's take a little time this morning and talk about the injustice of, in of systemic racism, an injustice that maintains totally segregated communities throughout America. The fact is that Americans are living in more segregated communities today than in the 1960s when the civil rights movement was going strong. And this is not because people of color, especially black folks, have chosen to live with people who look like them. No, this is, this is due to the deliberate segregating of our nation 
by the federal government and by state governments and by local governments, you know, redlining. Read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. I have a list of books that you can read in order to open up your mind to a more fulsome American history. That's one of them. The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. That redlining has put a big red target on black communities where government does not have to provide the same services that other communities, predominantly white ones, take for granted. It lets appraisal systems know where they should undervalue homes and whose homes to undervalue. This systemic racism in home ownership continues today, even when a black family has a home in a predominantly white community, systemic racism is at play. So let me give you an example of the kind of systemic racism that I read about recently in the New York Times. Seems that last summer, Nathan Connolly, a professor at Johns Hopkins University, and his wife had their house in Baltimore appraised in order to refinance their mortgage. They believed that their house, improved with renovations worth about $40,000, was worth much more than the $450,000 they paid for it in 2017. But a Maryland appraisal company put the home's value at $472,000. So they chose not to refinance at that time. Months later, after that first appraisal, the couple applied again to refinance their loan. This time, they removed all their family photos, all of their children's drawings of figures with dark faces. They took down their poster of the Black Panther movie and all the literature of black authors, anything that would signal that this house is owned by black people. And they had a white male colleague, another professor from Johns Hopkins, to stand in for them during the appraisal. And you tell me where you think the second appraisal came in. Hmm? 600,000? Was that the? Hmm? You know, you went too high. Hard to believe. It came in at $750,000. You know, as I have talked with and listened to lots of white people about systemic racism over the last few years, I've discovered that many well-intentioned people don't know what we even mean when we talk about systemic racism. So I thought I'd provide a definition of systemic racism for you. This comes from a journal article on health disparities by Paula Braveman and a bunch of other people. <laughs> they write this. Systemic and structural racism are forms of racism that are pervasively and deeply embedded in systems, laws, written and unwritten, policies and entrenched practices and beliefs that produce, condone, and perpetuate widespread unfair treatment and oppression of people of color with adverse consequences." Close quote. So, our appraisal example shows racism baked into the systems that appraisers use, that they're using today. It's white supremacy baked in. Another book on that list that you will get is uh, Heather McGee's The Sum of Us, S-U-M, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And she estimates that there is $68 billion worth of lost wealth for black homeowners because of this example of systemic racism. Another truth about systemic racism is that once a community is majority black, systemic racism shows big polluting industries where to locate their plants and their toxic waste dumps. It's actually cheaper for a corporation to pollute communities of color than white communities. Research has shown that if you are a corporation that very, uh, that violates environmental laws, the corporation is going to have to be fined, but the fines are actually tend to be lower in communities of color. 
So companies are incented to put their toxic waste dumps in poor black communities. But you have to ask yourself, why are the fines lower there? It's built into the system that values the lives of people living there less. It certainly shows a lack of love for those neighbors, a lack of love that plays into the evil of greed, the greed of the people making those decisions in big companies to spend as little as possible on the environment safety when it will only impact the lives of folks that they don't care about, neighbors whom they don't love. You know, these systems and structures are so intertwined that systemic racism just continues without any actual card-carrying racists fueling it. As I thought about the ways that systemic racism impacts the lo lived lives of real people, people whom Jesus would have us love, I wondered about the fact that the median income, annual income of black America is $24,000, while the median annual income of white America is $188,000. There are lots and lots of reasons, many of them caused by systemic racism, that explain this ridiculous disparity. So let me share another example of systemic racism that provides just one small contribution to that disparity. I heard this one on NPR on August the 17th, just five months ago. Seems that Hartford Healthcare made a splashy public announcement that it would start paying every employee at least $15 an hour starting in 2019. But what they actually did was continue to pay them $11.60 an hour and deduct $17.50 a day from their employees' pay to cover meals that the employees were never offered and that were never provided. Now, of course, this is racism built in because most of those workers, those health care aides, are black and brown people or immigrants or all three. The policy does not say we plan to mistreat black and brown people. Rather, it just does mistreat black and brown people. That's systemic racism. It's so embedded, we don't even know it's there. When a client of this, these workers, eventually, when she discovered what was happening, her complaints led to a, a lawsuit that they won. But it seems you can only be compensated for lost wages for two years back, no matter how long the situation has been going on. Seems like there's not much love for these essential workers. What did Jesus say? Love God and love neighbors. While we're talking about economic injustice, let's take a look at black farmers. The United States Department of Agriculture has been doing injustice for decades to black people who want to farm. Well, data shows that black farmers have been denied loans from the Department of Agriculture at a rate twice as high as white farmers. And if you know anything about farming, you know that getting a loan in order to plant your crop is essential. And due to this ongoing systemic racism, black farmers in the United States have lost about $326 billion worth of farmland during the 20th century according to the first study to quantify that loss. And that land loss was due to discriminatory lending policies of the Department of Agriculture and forced sales of those black farmers' land. Systemic racism. You know, one of the infuriating things about this stuff is that when anyone tries to fix it, folks yell, reverse discrimination, right? The Biden administration tried to make loans to black farmers who had been the victims of systemic racism all these decades, but had to pull back because of all the white farmers complaining, essentially complaining that they were no longer benefiting from the unfairness of the system. 
It is only in knowing this stuff that we can hope to do anything about it. It's only in taking off the fig leaf that we are able to see the evil. In order to lift our voices about the areas where racism still reigns, we have to know about it, right? Here's another example that I just heard about on a Sunday morning on NPR. In sugar cane fields of Florida, part of the harvesting pro process includes burning the fields to get rid of the straw around the inner cane. Now in Brazil, where most of the world's sugar comes from, they no longer burn because of the air pollution that the burning produces and the health risks for the people in the area. Seems like they care about those people. They have developed another way to harvest sugarcane that does not include burning. But in Florida, the sugarcane companies continue to burn and most of the resulting smoke blows over communities in the glades. The, those communities are filled with mostly black and brown people. There's even a ban. There's a ban on burning when the wind changes direction and blows east toward the wealthier, whiter communities like West Palm Beach. Cane burning is banned if it will make wealthy white people sick, but it's deemed perfectly fine when blowing over communities of color, where the incidence of various lung diseases affects almost every family. Systemic racism, right? I bet those sugar company executives in Florida would not think of themselves as racist, but their disdain for poor, blacker Americans results in racism, right? You know, first we saw the battle against CRT and true history, and now those same forces are moving on to destroy DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. The targets of hatred have grown to include more and more categories of people, black people, brown people, LGBTQIA people. We are all of us sorely tempted to just stick our heads in the sand and ignore evil when the sneaky snake gets to work on our good intentions. But if we hope to participate with God in the creation of the beloved community, a community where evil is exposed and when we, where we work together to turn society back toward the Eden of creation, where love of God and love of one another reigns supreme, then we have to be willing to name the truth about the ways that our society falls short of its own ideals of liberty and justice for all. We must, every one of us, learn the truth. We must testify to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. And then we must work to eradicate the evil that snake-like people do. May it be so. Ashe and Amen. Our closing hymn will be Take My Life. It can be found on page, our number, 609, in your chalice hymnal. Please stand in body and or spirit.
Will you please join me with the Common Commission? Let us go forth into the world in peace, being of good courage, building fast in that which is good, rendering no one evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honoring all people, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads for the benediction? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our discomforter, be with you always. Amen. Amen.